time for episode two of the Racer X Supercross preview show, Monster Energy AMA Supercross and FIM World Championship coming your way in January. Go to supercrosslive.com for the schedule and info or watch our show and we'll make some predictions. This is episode two, we're calling it The Leap. There are several riders who are looking to get that one last step to become genuine uh, multi-time race winners and title contenders. We talked about Dungey, Roxon, and Tomac, established players in episode one. Let's talk about some riders who have won races or have come close, but want to win more. We're talking Marvin Muscan, very good last year, nearly won a race. Cole Seeley's won a race before, and Jason Anderson won two last year. And we'll start with Jason Anderson. Those two wins last year, third in the points, very solid performance from him. Let's talk about the leap. Can he make that leap? That's probably the biggest chasm there is from a guy that can win some races to out and out win the title. That's tough. I think he can. The, the one word that I think Jason Anderson needs to find is consistency. Mm -hmm. He came out and won Anaheim 1 last year. Yeah. He, he's obviously not scared of the big stage. I predicted he would win Anaheim 1. He had such a great offseason. I don't think he's necessarily in that same place after his, his Motocross of Nations injury. Yep. Uh, but I think he's going to be a player. I don't have him in the in the 17 round championship hunt because I just don't think he's ready for that yet. I think that the top three, especially the top two, are just too established, too strong, and too confident right now. Uh, but I do think he's going to be in, in the battle for some race wins. He's going to get a start. He's got the speed. He's going to feel it on a certain night and win. I just don't think he's ready for 17 rounds of that level yet. There's been a lot of talk, by the way, about, uh, by you, in fact, the race craft of Anderson, who's not, I don't think, dirtying people because he just feels good taking people out, but he tries hard to make passes and is aggressive and right on that line or over the line. Well, I think some of the passes that people thought Jason Anderson was, was dirty on, I thought they were fine. Uh, yeah. There was a couple of passes that I, the one that comes to mind with Brayton at St. Louis. I thought that was over the line. I thought his collisions with Sealy a couple races in San Diego. I thought that was fine and it was normal racing. Here's the thing about Anderson though. When you look at Ryan Villapoto, you look at Ryan Dungey, uh, heck, you go back to uh, Jeremy McGrath or Ricky Carmichael. They didn't make these types of passes to win races, which means they didn't make any enemies out there. You're gonna need friends as you go down the line when you wanna be a championship hopeful guy. You're gonna need friends on the track and if you don't have any, heck, it's gonna be a lot harder to come through the pack. I love the way Anderson rides. Jersey's untucked, uh, he's hanging it out, but I'm with JT. He's on the Eli Tomac level where he has to get the starts. He has to be there for 17 weekends, and 17 races and 18 weekends. Uh, I think Dungey can do that and I think Kenny Roxon can do that. But for Anderson and somewhat Tomac, you gotta, you gotta be on there, you gotta get the start. And Anderson, when you combine Anderson's inconsistency with his lack of friends out there, I don't know about being a champion. I think that leads to itself. I think a lot of those aggressive passes were because he was starting seventh and saying, I gotta get to the front, and he's still pretty new to the class, and I think learning, okay, what's the line here? What do you think? Yeah, and I think it's more, not so much he even has that friends, it's gotta be like a neutrality. You just have to be neutral. Right. Right? You can't be looking over your shoulder in every single corner and come out 17 rounds as a champion. That just can't happen. So I, I, I agree with your point. It's just gotta be to where people aren't looking to knock you down. But having said that, JT, some of those passes that people cried foul on, nothing was wrong with them. It was aggressive super cost racing. Aggressive, but I think where he was pushing Sealy off the track, his Atlanta pass, his San, San Diego pass, those are gonna have revenge at some point. People are going to be looking to knock you down at some point during the season, and one time like that can end your championship run. So I think I would, you know, I think there's both sides of the coin where you say, was it foul, was it fair? Sure, but it only ma it only matters in the mind of the rider that's gonna retaliate. If he thinks it was foul, I it doesn't matter what we think. It's perception and reality. Exactly. If Sealy thinks it was dirty, that's even if it matters. wasn't, that's all that matters. And that's I agree, all. I don't think that many of his passes were that crazy, but if the other riders think so, I'm, perspective. Just, I'm yeah. just happy he unblocked me. Did he? Yeah. Unblock past you? Yeah. Very similar. Okay. Yeah, we're friends now, I guess. Um, his friend is Marvin Muscan, who actually rides with uh, Anderson and also uh, Ryan Dungey down at the Baker's Factory. And an interesting situation with those two. You, we just talked about Anderson, how aggressive he hangs it out, jerseys untucked, coming through the pack. Marvin is like the most calculated guy out there. And it would be impossible for him to have enemies. Impossible. He's the nicest guy in the world. Marvin should be more like Anderson, and Anderson should be more like Marvin. They need to morph. They need to, to, to move towards each other. To be the ultimate racer. To take a step above everybody. Marvin was good last year. He didn't win a race as a rookie, but he led 19 and a half laps of one in Atlanta. It was pretty solid after a kind of a slow start. So did he finally get that win? I think he absolutely wins a race. Yeah. Uh, I think, can he find that speed every single weekend? Because 
we've seen a vulnerability with Marvin. If the and this is my own perspective, if the whoops are very big, yeah, I think that's a weak spot for Marv. I think he has a tough time being on the level of say Kenny when the track is crazy technical in the whoops, where there's no chance to jump, you can't rhythm through them, you just gotta sack up and blitz very big whoops on a very very difficult section. So. I have a th I have a feeling you're saying this your own personal perspective in more ways than one. Well, oh, yeah, like of course I really struggle with this, but I've watched Marvin as well. I've watched him in the 250 class. I've watched him in the 450 class. He is at his best when he can find a rhythm in whoops when they when they rut out or the consistency goes away in blitzing. Uh, so I think he will have his weekends where he can come out and, and a track like Atlanta or a track like Toronto. Uh, he's going to be great, just like he was last year. Uh, but a track like some of the Anaheim ones where you just, there's no choice. You've just got to blitz and you've got to be very, very good at and proficient at blitzing. Those are the, still the races where I think he's get, he would lose a championship run. One more thing to debate here when it comes to Muscan. He has been awesome during these off-season races, which leads to the annual debate over, does that mean anything come the new season? You got to see him in Lille. I saw him at Red Bull Straight Rhythm beat Ryan Dungey straight up. For whatever that's worth, it's Straight Rhythm. We know the Lille race sometimes doesn't always apply. Do you think this means something? Is this something? I think it's something, yeah. but I don't think it's huge. I do okay. think it's something. You come into the off season uh, a little bit more, or come into the season with a great off season, coming a little more confident, a little more uh, uh, knowing that you're on point and you're ready to race. Yeah. You've got gate drops, that type of thing. But I think it's a small percent of what you're going to carry forward to Anaheim. But absolutely, I think it means something. What do you think? I think it matters, but still, even with the races that Marvin's race, he's still going to have a month off. So a month is still a significant amount of time. It's, it's not like he's coming, he's going to race New Year's Day, and then he's going to hop into Anaheim. So there's still that downtime, that's that time where you kind of recoil a bit. Uh, but I think it's really, it, it bodes well for Marvin that he's in such a good place and, and really the confidence. Because I think he's going to go into Anaheim like, I'm equal with these guys. I should be winning. Where I don't think last year he necessarily thought that way. JT, can we talk about how we each threw in a victory straight with him as meaning anything? I, uh, what happened last year is right, rhythm. but the Marvin was rhythm. dominant. I specifically said, I don't, for whatever that's worth, I, I don't that's feel what like, that means. That's hedging a bet. I don't feel like you should even bring that I up. I shouldn't even bring that but up. But Marvin was dominant. Hey, there was folks, only one race that Marvin we beat Dungy Marvin went to in. a local fair race in Dade City, uh, took the win. We're looking forward to big things. I mean, it's Did he beat Ryan Dungy in Lil or in Geneva? Thing. Did he beat Ryan Dungy in Lil or Geneva? Marvin Muscan went very fast in a straight line, everybody. Should have no problems. Okay, you were here pumping it up with Stu last year, so... I Marvin Muscan was able to beat Justin Brayton lesson. in Geneva, so that shows that he's going to be Supercross champ. He beat Justin Brayton and Malcolm Stewart, who doesn't even have a I'm ride. I'm just saying. Okay, so I that applies like that's much even more. Worth mentioning. That applies much more. Let's talk about the third guy. Uh, we're no. I'm going to just let's calm down. I'm going to send it to uh, Ping out here in California. Hey guys, we're here in Anaheim at Angel Stadium, and we wanted to get inside and kind of picture the calm before the storm. Get some of the empty seats that'll be filled up soon, but. We were met with a very hostile Angel Stadium personnel who uh, told us to stay off the premises. So we're just outside the, the limits of the uh, property here. We're gonna shoot from right here. So uh, thanks for all the hospitality there, Angel Stadium. We're talking about Muscan and Anderson. These two guys, probably not the top two title contenders if you're looking at riders' names, but I think they're two guys that everybody should be watching. They're probably a couple of the most exciting guys Two of the guys you may see moving forward through the pack more than anybody else. Um, and it is interesting and unique that they're training together down in Florida uh, with Alden Baker. And, and, and you know, Anderson on the track is wildly aggressive. Last year, there was definitely some questionable moves. Um, if you like aggressive riding, he's your dude. I mean, he is not afraid to run in there and smash you. Uh, but I think at times it costs him because he'll make people mad who then retaliate and cost him time. And sometimes he comes in hot and actually makes so much contact that it messes him up too. So I think he's got to find a, a little bit more tact and strategy in some of those passes. But oftentimes he makes it work and I, I love watching him ride, it's awesome. Muskin, on the other hand is a surgeon. Very, very precise, um, doesn't push it in terms of getting out of control or, or just closing his eyes and twisting the throttle. He's very precise with what he does. So their riding styles couldn't be any more different. But if you talk to them both off the track, they're actually pretty similar. They're real quiet, kind of mellow, down to earth, very friendly, um, just a couple of really nice guys. So I think as long as those two can avoid any drama on the practice track or test track, they're gonna be fine. They get along fine. I'm sure those two uh, will push each other. They're both probably similar in speed. So I said this before, I'm a big believer. When you got a couple of guys who are close, 
in skill level and they work together, it, it elevates both of them. You know, a rising tide floats all ships. So those two are going to work together and I think both of them will come out swinging really hard in 2017. And like I said, I think they get along fine off the track. I don't think there's any drama. Uh, at the media, we like to stir stuff up, but I think those two get along fine. I don't think there's any issues, but um, you know, all that takes is one good skirmish on the track and uh, it could get real uncomfortable down there at the Baker's factory. Okay, Pink, so things are looking good for Marvin Muscan right now. Things are looking really good. Mm, not for long. I've got a graphic to show you. This is rookie winners of the last 25 seasons of Monster Energy Supercross, and you're looking at all the riders as rookies that won races in that time frame. 14 times we've had a rookie win one race or more, and only four out of those 14 increased their amount of wins in year two. 10 times they either won the same or fewer. So Muscan didn't win a race last year, but we're assuming, oh, he'll get better. It's year two, he'll improve. More often than not, that actually doesn't work that way, as strange as that sounds. And one of the riders on that list is Cole Seeley. Won a race as a rookie in 2015. We thought, look out, he'll be even better in 16. Didn't quite work out that way. So where do we have Cole Seeley now in year three? Cole Seeley's my sleeper pick. All right. I'm not for the title, but for multiple race wins and, and a Ooh, top three nice. in points because, you know, things always go sideways with injuries in our sport. I'm really high on Seeley. I think he's going to do well. I think he's technically he's a very good rider. He's had a, he's had a strong offseason, full offseason of riding. He's, uh, he's taking his craft a little bit more seriously. Resigned with Honda. They showed a commitment to him. I like Seeley. I think uh, if he can stay away from injury, of course, that goes with all these guys. Yeah. I, I, look, I like for Seeley to win multiple races next year. That's big. And remember, all this talk we had in episode one about Honda, the effort, the money, the electronics, the mechanics, the guys all, from Japan. That's his. That's part of the reason why I think that. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Seeley here? Uh, I know you're high on Seeley. I, I just think you're high, yeah. though. Uh, in multiple, general, uh, yeah, right. on multiple points. Multiple race wins, you I think it's, it's a stretch. I think uh, if he could get one, that would be great. I think with the lineup, if everybody's going in healthy, uh, the way things are panning out, these guys with Roxon being the best we've ever seen him, I think Dungey will be Ryan Dungey again. I don't think it leaves a lot of room. We haven't even talked about guys like Cooper Webb and these other guys that are going to be in the mix. Talk about them, yeah, go ahead. No, but I, yeah. I, I just think ask multiple race wins out of Sealy, yeah. I think it's a stretch. Well, I hope he blocks you. Oh, I, I, listen, Cole Sealy is a great rider. He will be a top five contender each and every week. I just think he's going to have a really tough time finding a way to beat those guys multiple times in a season. You know who believes in, in, uh, in Sealy? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yes, yes, no doubt. Huge fan of Cole Sealy. I think he discovered Cole Sealy. He found them. He, he dug him up. I think he was like living in a van down by the river and transitioned him into the Troy Lee Honda team. And now Sealy's gone to great heights. David Pingree is out in California. So let's talk about one of your favorite Supercross riders. And he has been improving. The bike is improving. How far can Sealy go in 2017? Thanks, guys. Well, Cole Sealy is uh, one of my favorite riders, there's no question. But I can't take all the credit for helping him. Jeff Ward's the one that really pushed him on us when I was at Troy Lee Designs. Uh, I had seen Cole a little bit on his Suzuki early in his career, but uh, Jeff really believed in him, and those guys still work together today, and uh, I I'm glad Jeff came to us with Cole. He turned out to be uh, just a really great kid and, a and an amazing rider. So where can he get to this year? You know, I've heard a lot of chatter that I thought he and Roxon would get along really well. Uh, Roxon likes to have a good time, keep it loose and fun, and Cole is very much that same way. He doesn't like to be pushed too hard, He's got to have fun. He's got that, uh, you know, a little bit of ADD. So you have to let him have a good time, but still keep him working hard enough to be ready to go. You got to walk a fine line with Cole. And uh, I think when Ken came over, it was a real threat to Cole. Um, he, he saw him as competition, and he, he didn't want to become second fiddle on the, on the team. So the stories that I've been hearing out of the Honda 10 is Cole worked so hard these past couple of months, he's kind of dug himself in a hole physically. And uh, I think he's got it turned around. He's working with a, a trainer that his a friend at Adidas set him up with. And I think they've got it corrected and he's doing well. He's been riding really well. Uh, from what I understand, he's, he's really focused and really wants to do well this season. Does not want to get beat by Ken Roxon. So that's a pretty tall order. Uh, I'm curious to see how he does. Like I said, you've, you've got to walk a fine line with Cole where he's still enjoying himself. Let him go do his drifter cars and let him play his guitar, ride his skateboard but just make sure he's getting his motos in and, and doing the things he needs to do on the bike during the week. So it sounds like they've got that balance worked out. Jeff Ward's still working with them. Those guys have been doing good things. And when it comes to talent, there's no question. Cole Seely can win races and has. So I think you'll see him up at the front this year. Uh, I'd like to say he's gonna be a title contender, 
but he's going to have to find some consistency week in and week out to be able to run with Dungy, Roxton, and, and Tomac. Uh, I'm a big believer in Cole Seeley, and I think we're going to see him up front. Okay, that's uh, David Pingree showing you how things can go one way and things can go another. Um, here's the problem when you make the bold claim and then you say, oh, he's not going to win multiple races, and you say he is. We do not hate these dudes. We're not hating on them. But here's the problem. There's 17 races. Very rarely do you even get a year with six winners. Five is usually about the max. Last year we only had four. So somebody's not going to win a race. And winning multiple races out of 17 when there's sometimes only four guys winning at all, that's the problem. Yeah, episode one, we talked about uh, Ryan Dungey, Kenny Rocks, and Eli Tomac. All three of us think that all three of those guys get yeah. some wins. Jason Anderson winning is not going to be surprising at all. So now we're up to four. That's the same and only winners we had last year. Only we four. only had four winners yeah. indoors and out. Yeah. last year, yeah. so that's it. But now I'm saying Seeley's going to win. We said Marvin's going to get a win. Folks, these six guys, they're not going to get wins. Somebody's going to go win less. Uh, and this also and it ain't going to be Seeley. Multiple. And then Chad Reed is going to watch this and say, oh, they're doubting me again. So let's add seven, eight, Sorry, nine Marv. The Sorry, Coop. Sorry, Reed. Don't know what to tell that's, you. That's the problem. Okay, well, we'll see who's right and who's wrong. Well, okay, wait a minute here. Uh, Anderson, Muscan, and Seeley, JT. Do all three get a win? I think so. I think so. I, but I, the multiple is what gets me. Okay. I think they find a night where things click. Like when Cole Sealy won in Houston. He got the whole shot. He got away early. And then it was basically that's how it went. But that situation never played out again. It's like that one night where everything goes right and they're feeling it. I think that's what has to happen for a guy like Marvin, Cole, or Jason Anderson. Where a guy like Dungey and Roxon every weekend they're gonna be feeling it. They have that pace, they have the consistency. So I, that's where I struggle with the multiple winner. This group of three will produce two wins total. I don't know what, who of those two riders will be, but there will be two wins produced out of this group. They will not win a race, all three of them. It's only 17 rounds, not enough pie to go around. Not blame pie, but just pie. Speaking of pie, is it time for lunch? Yeah, Mathis wants to go. Uh, we're gonna remind you there are three cities that are uh, back on the schedule this year. Seattle is back, Minneapolis is back, and Salt Lake City is back. So go to supercrosslive.com. That's awesome to be back at those places. We got a lot of friends in some of those cities. So we're happy to be revisiting those and go to the website so you can get ticket information and everything else you need for 2017 Monster Energy Supercross. We'll see you in episode three.